different ways of actually directing medical nanobots. We're now going to look at some technology development pathways for the nanobots itself with uh, four presentations, uh, which will be followed by a lunch break. The first presentation comes from Sylvain Martel. Dr. Martel is currently associate professor in the Department of Computer Engineering and the Institute of Biomedical Engineering at the Ecole uh, uh, Polytechnique um, at, at the Ecole uh, Polytechnique in Montreal. Uh, Dr. Martel has uh, also been the founder and creator of the Nano Robotics Laboratory at the Ecole Polytechnique Montreal, which he founded in 2002. So he really is a true pioneer in this field. He's published some really amazing work. He's definitely a, a leader uh, in the industry. And it's been recognized by his peers by um, providing him with the prestigious honor of holding the Canada Research Chair in micro and nanosystem development, uh, fabrication, and validation since 2001. Dr. Martel, it's a great honor to have you present to us today. So thank you for the uh, introduction. Uh, so, okay. So first, let me explain what, uh, what we're doing in nanorobotics lab. We're developing an uh, instrument, actually, and uh, we have many uh, projects. I don't have the time to talk about everything here. But those are tools. We're developing toolbox, and one of the main applications is the, uh, to reduce the, uh, the dose of uh, drugs uh, to, uh, in some case, like I said, in some case, replace uh, chemotherapy by reducing the uh, uh, drugs and try to boost a bit uh, what the research has done with the functionalization and, and drugs thing like that, and try to bring directly to the terminal uh, region. And uh, so to help the doctor fighting the, uh, you know, cancer and the, the different type of cancer. The, uh, here I'm talking about <laughs> traveling the arteries to the uh, microvascular so with different type of uh, nanobots. And, uh, one I want to show here, we talk about a bit NASA uh, just before the coffee break, and the bit is very similar. In robotics, uh, you need to track a device and you need to have a trajectory go to point A to point B the, uh, at, at the fastest route. And for that, you need a feedback control. And uh, if you look at, if you use only one type of uh, device or nanobot in this case, it's like trying to send a robot on planet Mars using one type of vehicle and you know that we need something different, different trust to go against gravity. We need to go from planet Earth to Mars, and that we need to land on Mars, which is completely different, and on Mars to explore the surface is going to be a different system. And the way we see it right now, uh, in 2010, uh, from all the experience that we did in all the, uh, the calculation and the uh, device that we developed, that's the same conclusion that we came. It doesn't say that I know the, uh, the next speaker will talk about the probably a robot, artificial robot, going to the bloodstream and thing like that. But I'm talking uh, what can we do right now in 2010 or the next uh, few years uh, to come. Um, the, I'm in engineering. I was electrical engineering. I work in my data engineering, mechanical engineering. Now I'm in computer engineering. So I'd be all my life uh, pretty much engineering. <laughs> I touch about every type of engineering except mining engineering, maybe. And uh, the when we try to uh, attack this problem of targeting, we look at artificial way. Try to use uh, the material and components and uh, try to solve the problem. But the quick we found that there's limitation in physics. And uh, we work with MEMS, things like that, and the technology today doesn't allow it to go at a scale, a small scale. We need to go down to, if you want to go to the close to the tumor, go to the microvasculature, and if you use, look at the hydrodynamics of the, uh, the vascular system, and you, look, you apply the physics, you need to go about two micron in size. That's what you need to do. And this is impossible 
with technology because of a different thing. You got friction, stiction, you got the power issue, you got everything. And uh, then I was thinking we need to get another strategy there. Then I said, what about if those robots actually exist in nature? What if exist in nature? So the first step would be try to find this robot and then try to see, because we don't have, it's like we got this new toy, and try to find out about how it works. But we don't have the instruction sheet, so we start playing with it. Try to understand how it works. And then we integrate it into the computer program to have it to do what a typical artificial robot would do, and they call that a natural nanobot, if you want. Okay? So that was my short introduction here. So first, as you see, the medical robotics at different scale. So there's those big robots that do try to do minimally invasive, things like that, big platform. And then the, the camera appeal, you know, to the uh, <coughs> GI tracks. And then they put the integration mark. What is how the next robot will look like? Here's one of the things that we're working right now. Those are microparticles that contain nanoparticles. And we use dipole dipole interaction. So somebody asked uh, this uh, before the coffee break, why an MRI? Because if you have a ferromagnetic material or super pyromagnetic material, you saturate the material at about for uh, the best material, let's say uh, uh, iron cobalt, for instance, or it can be iron oxide, about 0 0.8 Tesla. The clinical MRI, typical MRI, I got 1.5 Tesla, which fully saturate the material. And if you use the gradient, orthogonal gradient used for slice selection, then you get the maximum force on the, on the material for propulsion or steering around, stuff like that. And this is why that if you use an X-ray system, you need to create this high homo homogeneous field plus the gradient field, so you end up building an MRI system. That's why it makes more sense that use already an MRI system for that. The other thing is that the special resolution of the MRI is not as good in some instance as an X-ray uh, system or CT scan. But if you put a particle into, into this, you can adjust that so it will create an artifact, it can be a different size, up to maybe 70 times the size. So it's like having a transmitter that emit a large signal and that allow you to be able to localize a smaller device that something will not be possible to see with CT scan. Okay? So here we use a dipole inter interaction. Those nanoparticles, they use for many purposes. If you use correctly, you can functionalize it for what we talk about, like we do uh, with the research in nanoparticle use some biodegradable uh, polymers. If you put the right quantity of that and you mix with drugs, they can be used as nano engine because you can induce the force and propel there. They use also as a contrast agent. So they emit the signal that you can locate with MRI and the controller now know what to do to correct the trajectory and put it back on tracks. And also those nanoparticles create dipole dipole interaction that help maintaining those aggregate togethers, increase the force, increase the signal, increase the amount of drugs that can be delivered, if you want. And at the same time, you can control, if you synthesize correctly, the dipole dipole interaction so they, can, uh, they don't uh, get uh, stuck somewhere, but they take different form when we go to larger blood vessels to smaller one. Okay? So targeting, reaching target location inside the human body. Here's a real fact is that Again, we go back to the uh, space exploration. So we can send right now a robot on planet Mars very precisely where we want it. But if you want to go to the blood vessel at the maybe one centimeter in the human body, it's not possible. And we spend much more money actually on the medical field than it is stuff like that. Okay, so when we talk about the targeting, there's, there's nice things going on with ligand, with uh, you know, peptide, uh, all kind of biomolecules to target this, the <coughs> drugs. A lot of research going on, but like I said, we call it direct targeting. It's just that we try to localize and constrain in specific places to help all those research to, uh, uh, 
to become more efficient there. So when you go into the, those uh, blood vessel, I put a bit of picture of blood vessel there with a map of a road map over there. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter how smart your robot is. If you can put the intelligence there, everything looks the same. I know me, I will get lost for sure. You know, even Einstein is with me, he will get lost. You know, we, we, there's no map, there's nothing. So you need a GPS system, right, for that. And the GPS is the MRI system. So that's why you can, okay, those robots that go to bloodstream, that's fine, they go randomly everywhere. But if you go from point A to point B, try to avoid other organ there. So you need a GPS system for that. That's why the MRI is good because it can, it's a controller. If the sensor gather information, act on the device, and maintain on the trajectory there, stuff like that. This is what the, uh, uh, the pilot, if you want, uh, what the doctor see. Uh, we have all kinds of windows, I don't have the time to go in details over there. Uh, but this is the, uh, all kinds of parameters we can adjust, and the computer software is there too, because different carriers will have different uh, uh, force and just a different thing. If you change the, the percentage of drugs, it will change also things, so everything is uh, categorized. And you get a, a six is the uh, tracking of the device there. <coughs> so here what we see is the carotid artery of a pig, 25 kilogram pigs, that was maintained alive. And, the, uh, and what you see uh, at D, what we see A, B, and C, those are filter stuff, and the dust, those are waypoint. So we tell at this specific time we want it to be there. So it comes to your control. And uh, D, you see the artifact generated by that. So it took about two years to develop an algorithm that can track the device very precisely, position at about between 20 and 30 times per second, which is required. So the correction is done about 20 to 30 times per second. And what you see G here is the mixed with uh, angio image. You see the spinal cord. I don't know where I put my eye. Here we go. So you, you see the spinal cord over there, the leg of the, of the pig. And this is the carotid artery over there. And this device was moved automatically under computer control at the uh, average speed of 10 centimeters per second. Mm. This is a 1.5 millimeter speed, okay? So you can go even uh, further away from, from the catheter. And then we put the catheter back and we click on the bottom and, with the magnet and bring it back to the catheter to retrieve the device, okay? So, so the basic equation here, I don't know how much time I have. Five minutes. <laughs> huh? I have 10 minutes, good, okay. I always talk too much. I'm used to give an hour talk. <laughs> I'm really bad at 20 minutes talk. So here's the basic equation, sir. As you see, because we have to, unfortunately, we're on the, on the world where we have to, as engineer, I always follow the law of physics. And you see the force induced on, the, uh, on those carriers, so on the nanoparticle, if you add it together there, it creates an effective volume V ferro there. And uh, this is a gradient stuff. The MRI for, provides 40 millitesla per meters. Stuff. And the, you got M is magnetization saturation of the material. Even with the best material, we're using the best material, you limit with V. And V decreases by cube. And the, the blood flow is, it, it doesn't decrease the cube. It's more linear stuff like that. When you go to smaller blood vessel, the blood flow decreases, but doesn't decrease uh, as fast as the force and the volume. So at some point when I'm going to say that, so we're going to have a, a problem with, the, uh, uh, with this thing. So what can we do? We use aggregate cells. So, uh, so many particles together, those are 40 micron, and they, they form an aggregate over there. And you can see if we put gradient to zero millitesla, they go 50%, 50% over there on each side. If you put 400 millitesla, they, they, they pretty much all go in the same. So you can navigate quite effectively there. We're talking about the 35% of a nanoparticle of uh, iron oxide covered with, uh, um, with a small cover nanometers of graphite uh, and with uh, doxorubicin uh, mixed with that. And, uh, and so somebody asked me, so why not just put a magnet there? If we put a magnet outside, what happened is the nanoparticle is the gradient is stronger at the surface of the skin, right, towards the magnet. So first, you don't have any navigation thing. And, and second, it's more trapping stuff, and the thing become more effective near the skin because the magnet is close to the skin. With an MRI there, it doesn't matter how the depth, it's completely independent. It's as effective in middle torso that it is at the surface. So it's a big advantage. Plus, you can track it and correct it, something you cannot do with a magnet over there. So here, with the, this is a release of catheter. 
Really is there, we call it TMMC. And here how they looks like, okay? Those are real wine with duxo rivets in. And they contain nanoparticle. And the, uh, with bell degraded uh, polymers, I've been using those, we synthesize those. And we release from a catheter and navigate it into the uh, bloodstream, in this case for the liver. So I've been tests on the uh, rabbit in this case. One other way you can do is control the blood flow with embolization. Those are other types, so we develop different types of those carriers. Uh, those are uh, a device that, with a specific site on the particle, 120 kilohertz uh, 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 magnetic field, you can eat at three or four degrees. And those are hydrogel based, so they will change volume 50%. So you can control the volume of those, of those guys. So you can uh, have another mechanism based on heat actuation if you want. So after all those things, we still have all the trick we use, like all that interaction and everything, we still have a limit there. So the problem, because of the volume, the maximum we can do on the human body, technically because of cooling issue, even we use the uh, superconducting coil, everything, very expensive system is about four to 500 milliliter per meters. On the rabbit, it will be different. This is a maximum, and this is some safety issue too. I mean, the nervous system start to, okay? And so then we need to do something else. So what we need to increase the proportion and steering force when we get the smaller blood vessel because the aggregate doesn't work anymore. There's no space to make aggregate there. And to get to the tumor, you know, the, the capillary can go down to a few microns, four microns, stuff like that. So we need to increase that. So example, to my dream and nanomachine, we're talking about those programmer control micro scale, uh, you know, and uh, robots and things to do with various tasks. And that's what some views of medical nanobots there. But the 2010 version is a bit different there, okay? First, I'll just show you that something would be, it's electronic chips, okay? And this is uh, 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 probably the smallest uh, solar cell in the world. So uh, we can do near infrared stuff, it penetrates the skin, and activate the electronics with uh, a different sensor, stuff like that. But this thing's still pretty big. I mean, it's uh, 150 micron, 200 micron. That's the best we can do. It's huge. We're far from the two micron size, stuff like that. We're very far. And we're pushing technology there. You know, we wait like a year to be able to build this thing. And uh, so the question today, and perhaps tomorrow as well, is that should we go with artificial now and if, or natural nanobots, you know? And here's what they propose it. Okay. Uh, so uh, the interrogation mark become this bacteria over there, which is about one to two micron in diameter, so with two microns, so the perfect size for the capillaries. And this thing is, uh, so here's, I can ask the question again. Somebody will say, yeah, but we're going back like when they have the horse, it's thing like that versus the car, right? So the question is, should we, should we have a horse with an S versus a horse powered, <laughs> right? So it's it's easy question to answer. I will probably go with the car. But if I tell you that this horse 150 times ran run 150 times its body length, you know per second, and you compare what the car can do, it's so, a well, now I'm start thinking maybe the horse might be that's a super horse might be interesting here, right? So here's the same thing. Those bacteria do about the two micron. They can go about 300 micron per second, and this is huge. This is about 10 times faster than the other flagellate bacteria. Okay, so what about natural nanobots designed like artificial nanobots? If you look more carefully, if it will be a designer, I have the technology to do that. This is the electric motors over there with stator and the rotor. If you look more carefully, it's uh, two bundle of flagella, and each one's got a molecular motors uh, uh, less than 300 hydrogen atom across there. And, stuff. and they turn 360 degrees. And the, you see it's very similar to the design of that. Actually, it's the same design, exactly the same design. If you look at the Reynolds number, hydrodynamic stuff like that, I would not put the propeller. I would put this, uh, this flagellum over there, which is much more effective and can prove mathematically stuff like that. So we end up, actually, if I had the technology, that's what I would build. And the size of the device would be exactly the same size. So we end up with the same design, pretty much. What about steering? Nanoparticle, 70 nanometers, single magnetic domain, iron oxide, biocompatible. They use it, MRI, stuff like that. The best crystal you can find. They cannot reproduce crystal better than that. They act a contrast agent. See here, we, we proved that we can see under MRI where they, where they are. We can, it's used magnetotaxis, so if you change the light magnetic field, 
you act a torque on that, it's a steering wheel. The motor turns full speed. 150 times the body line, you just direct it where you go. Okay. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm you're over. Good. You're good. You're I'm good. good? Yeah, you're good. One and a half minutes. Huh? One and a half minutes. One and a half minutes, I speed up there. <laughs> okay, this is a, one my student blood. The, this is a red blood cell. There's the white dust on the computer control. There's all bacteria. See how easy it is? They move very fast. Impossible to do today with that. That can be done anywhere in the human body. Okay, mm -hmm. this is human blood there. What about carrying load? Functionization, drugs, we don't work on that. We have the truck, you put whatever you want, it works. We attach nanoparticles, we develop antibodies. You mix it, self-assembly. Uh, they reproduce themselves, very good, very cheap. You go for a coffee, two hours later, population double, right? You, uh, next morning, is there. You have to be very careful, special recipe, they're very hard to cultivate. It took like uh, a while to, if you change the oxygen level at some points, like microelectronics there, they don't obey you anymore. So go over there, they don't go where you want it to go. <laughs> okay? Here, where it's very interesting, they're actually more sophisticated than you think, those robots. They have a lot of sensors. They, they, they can be phototaxis, chemotaxis, magnetotaxis, electric field, oxygen level. Example, aggregate. We need to keep, stay together there. Stay together to go somewhere because when they deliver the drugs there, then they said, okay, shut down into magnetotaxis, aerotaxis. I want to know the one to two percent oxygen level. That's what happened. They form a ring over there because of the drop of water. And then they expand it as it's stuff like that. So you can use, exploit the sensors actually. And if it's like a tumor stuff like that, the oxygen level will change. I have to stop there. Here I want to show that we can build different structures with those bacteria. 3,000 bacteria build a M shape. I cannot show you the movie because I'm over. We, uh, to convince people that bacteria could actually deliver drugs uh, somewhere, we have, uh, uh, I have a video where we built a, an ancient uh, pyramid in 15, uh, in 15 minutes under computer control. I, I cannot show you yeah, the video. We can see the video. And you saw the video? Yeah, we can go into the question time. Okay, and uh, yeah, okay, so we go to question times. So here we go. And uh, so what I want to say here is those bacteria, just to finish it, those bacteria, they're very, ex uh, they're very good at microvasculature, but in the larger blood vessel, the trust force, which is 4 to 4.7 piconewton, they're not strong enough. So right now, we encapsulate in the other technology, develop the other carrier, we encapsulate those bacteria to release them very close where they're more effective. And it looks a bit like what NASA is doing, actually. The astronaut can be the bacteria and it releases stuff like that, right? And this is what I show over here. So thank you very much. Okay. Oh, no, Sylvain, you, you, it's no problem at all. So uh, Dr. Uh, Martel seems to be on the same wavelength with Dr. Blumberg uh, in terms of the fantastic uh, voyage. We have about uh, six minutes for questions. Yes, please. Sorry, I wonder. Please uh, announce yourself again because each presentation right, is they a may separate become video. separated. Yes. Yeah. Steve Lee, uh, OSU. And I wonder if you could comment. You're talking about magnetotaxic bacteria. And if I remember correctly from bacterial physiology, the, the mechanism by which chemotaxis works, and presumably also magnetotaxis, is that the flagella are rotating in one direction. And then they have a, at some frequency, they change direction, the flagellar bundle flies apart, and they stop providing motive force, right? And uh, the mechanism by which chemotaxis works is that as you move up a gradient, the occurrence of that, the, the change in direction and the flagella flying apart and your loss of motive force, yeah. that frequency drops, right, as the gradient increases. And so they tend stochastically to migrate towards whatever it is they're attracted. But, but which frequency are you talking about? Which? Ah, the fre so frequency of direction change of the flagellar. Oh, yeah, 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 right, yeah. Well, this is something about advantage of metotaxis compared to uh, uh, chemotaxis. It's true the flagella will change to... Change to... Uh, and it's a random thing, which is not good in the engineering point of view. Uh, metotaxis is... Uh, it's a bit of the same thing. Those, those try to find the, uh, the oxygen gradient, one or two percent, and they will reverse it 
so they don't turn around. They reverse the flagellate to maintain it to this gradient, stuff like that. Now, they're, they're sensitive to 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 gauss. 0 0.5 gauss is the hurt geomagnetic field, you know. Uh, if you increase slightly to 1.5 to 2 gauss, which is almost nothing, you know, to generate, it's, it's very low power. Then the other component, chemotaxis and aerotaxis, become negligible, and they will not rotate it. They will go, actually, uh, we sent to oxygen gradient or some zone where they're going to die, and then we maintained it. So I'll tell you how they, they obey. It's a Swiss admission, and they go exactly where we want it to go. And so they don't have this reverse stuff like that. In the case where you have a very low magnetic field, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, yeah, this is true. They will reverse because other factors will influence that. But if you boost a bit the magnetic field, other component, they don't do it. They just go exactly where you want to do. Now, if we attach to big particles, stuff like that, they find out instead of pushing, they go around the effective, it will reverse it to pull the object. I have a video, I didn't have a, the time to present that. So there's some situation where they go reverse or forward. We know, we don't, we don't know everything, we know some what they do that, so we exploit that sometimes. But in this case, uh, if you increase a bit the two, three gauss, they will not have this reverse of the uh, molecular models. So, so where I was going with this yeah. is that I was wondering, it, it was like everything we've seen so far is an operator directs, yeah. right? Yeah. And so do you envision a system where basically uh, the, the nano robot itself has the capability to migrate up, say, a magnetic gradient, right, yeah. without the direct involvement of an operator? That's right. Actually, what we're doing right now is that we develop another platform just next to MRI with using registration techniques. The problem is at this small scale, MRI doesn't see the blood vessel. Now, we, we study how those uh, bacteria uh, react to different obstacles, and we transfer the control to this biological uh, bacteria. And what we found is if we modulate a certain thing like that, the, we increase the chance of those things to get to the tumor. So pretty much it's like, the, like an instinct, when right? we tell them that the, uh, the food or whatever is there, and they find a path to and do that. And they will actually, intrinsically we, make yeah, their way Yeah, they do to that. The... I didn't have time to show that. But actually, it doesn't work with one bacteria. If you have a swarm, enough population, mm -hmm. as soon as one finds a way, most of them will follow there, and they maintain together to deliver that. So because we cannot control that at this scale because the imaging modality doesn't allow us to see the route. We can see the target, we can see where they are, but we don't see in between. So when we get to microvascular, so now we study how they behave it, we exploit that, and we help them knowing some information about the microvascular. So we have some models that, but we don't know exactly the blood vessel. We mix that together, and then we increase the chance to those bacteria to that not 100% get there, but we, we try to use biology, if you want, those bacteria as a controller mixed with all this big platform around it to increase the chance to target it. Dr. Thank Martel, you. maybe instead of uh, further question, if you want to show the video, it could be, if, you, if, if it's easy for you to show, it could be helpful to illustrate what you are describing. And yeah, you yeah, could right. also talk yeah, to I us about here, I got here, here, for example, this is a microvascular so we don't see it. Right? It would be like having a... Uh, yeah, maybe the I didn't show there, but it will be like, okay, if you have this, this artificial uh, device, you don't know where it is. If you happen to uh, here, if you happen to be aligned, that's fine, but if you have something artificial, you get there, then you don't know where to go. Now, if you have many of those bacteria, and so there's a chance that one find a path over there, they don't get stuck at that, and the other one would follow there, okay? And it's pretty much what happened. I mean, this is a very simple video there. But this is 20 microns about the uh, vascular so human. I have another one on four microns, the smaller vascular. Cell. So the B is the magnetic field that we just say, okay, we get out of here. This is 20 microns. This is a big wall to make it more difficult there, right? And then we just orient over there. We don't know exactly where it is, but, well, there's some, because this is a uh, lab on chip, but you can see most of them will follow the path and stuff like that. But we lose some bacteria, for sure, it's not 100%, but we try to uh, increase the amount of stuff. Like that. There's still more work to be done because we don't understand all the behavior of this thing and exactly the, uh, the interaction between the, uh, uh, between the bacteria and what's the minimum population that we need, stuff like that, yeah. 
But that's the general idea. Yeah. Okay, thanks. One last question. Yeah, just, just real quick. Um, the idea behind this is, <clears throat> is what you want to try to do is get your particles in there so that they, and then something once they're there. And that's your benefit over just regular nanoparticles that have antibodies on them that people can already get to go to different targets. Yeah, right. Yeah, like right. That, the idea right? is that instead of being a, a huge quantity that can end up at a different location, it's to boost a bit, it's time to go point A to point B, and over there rely on what is done at the... Uh, so you're not documents. looking to actually deliver something in and have them self-assemble into a more complex behavior, which is no, trying to do. No, no, just no. no. So like I said, we're just carrier. I mean, you, you put whatever you want. It's, it's nanoparticle. It can be anything. We have developed antibodies. He attached to it. We encapsulate it. We deliver it. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. We're not on this business because we're engineered there, right? So, so we just go point A to B. And then how effective the drug is and stuff like that, I mean, I don't know. It's just a track and you load whatever you want there. So we try to make it as general as possible. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Dr.